Welcome to the Voice of Reason. I'm John Martin, your host, and I have with me our guest, uh, Charlie Gar Garbinian, and uh, now a new town meeting, town meeting member, and that's the first thing we're going to talk about. They have an article about recording your vote the next time you go, May 21st, and you already have an opinion about that study. I think it's a good thing, John, that they, that they do that for several reasons. Number one, if they have electronic recording of how people are voting on every single article or issue, whatever comes through for the town meeting, all of the consist consistents in every precinct will know a few things. Number one, they'll know if how many of their representatives were there at the meeting to vote. So it's an attendance uh, factor, and I think that's very important that people know which one of their representatives are there for every meeting or just what percentage of meetings they have attended. And secondly, it's important that they know how their representative m votes on a particular article. And perhaps in some cases, some constituents would contact their uh, precinct representatives and advise them or share with them their thoughts on how they think they should vote. Because if you're representing a precinct, you're representing people in that precinct. And somehow you should be in touch with those people and get a feeling as to how your precinct feels about a particular article. And then I suppose you have to in some way compromise that with how you feel about a particular article, balance, and then you come up with a vote. So I, I think it is a good thing. I think it's a wise investment of money. From what I have heard, it's not really a, a large amount of money they're gonna have to spend to put this in place. Initially, it may be slightly cumbersome for people to learn how this other system's going to work, but I don't see any major uh, obstacles in putting this into place. So well, technology's come a long way, getting cheaper all the time. Right. I mean, we know how uh, people at the state level vote and how people on the uh, federal level vote, as we should know, and we, sh and we also have a record of their attendance. Of if, you're, if you're a state representative or representative uh, to Washington, if they're in attendance for how many votes and so forth and so on. Well, here, here lately, you've been getting good TV coverage when they have these critical votes and they say, here's all the rep you know, here's all the representatives or all the so senators, who shows up, who's sick. Right. They get it all figured out for you. You don't have to look at electronics. <laughs> right. And to me, if somebody is a representative to town meeting, I should think they, they would be there virtually 100% uh, of all the meetings that are held. Occasionally, maybe somebody's not gonna maybe be there because of a scheduling conflict or if illness or, or a family situation, but I should think attendance should be at least 90% or more. But I understand, unofficially I understand that that is not always the case, that some people do not show up all the time. Yeah, uh, they're, they're looking for some kind of either critical vote, they wanna make sure they're counted, right. or, or not. Right. So anyway. Another thing I noticed upon watching the town meetings, in the years I've been watching, that when we have the annual meeting in May, that meeting will last two or three evenings. Am I correct? Yeah, because they've got to go through the budget. They have to go through right. the budget. So that's not done on one, e one meeting. And I think they go, what, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, or is it Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, if, it, if they need three days? What is your experience on that? Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. I went a few years myself. Right, I know. I was going to say. And uh, yeah, it's um, it's a real long meeting because they have to vote on every article. Uh, there's a lot of dynamics there because people are prepared with speeches and mm -hmm. maybe you know view graphs or something that ties things slows things down. But at least they're getting information out before the vote. Uh, of course. I think there's some complaints that the ones that get the most attention are the ones that the selectmen want. Right. Yeah. And uh, they'll make sure that some people are prepared to take on the uh, right. uh, arguments, uh, which is the way it should be, I guess. But, but on, on less important items, people just stand up and say a few words and then they right, go right to a vote. Right. 
in, that much? You know, watching these meetings, I noticed that when they pan uh, the audience, not every meeting has the same number of people there. No, and, and especially if it gets late. Right, and the other thing is when it starts to get late, a lot of people go home. And that's something I can't understand. If you are a town meeting member, I should think you would be there for the entire meeting. And if it's f and for a number of meetings as it's going to take to go through all the articles, if you're going to do your job as a town meeting member because you are representing people in your precinct. Well, the first vote they take is how late are we staying each night? I think what is they usually it's like ten o'clock. Ten or so ten. You can't yeah. start a new article right uh, after ten o'clock. After ten o'clock, which is a decent rule. Uh, but the, <clears throat> the the concept of of a true democracy, obviously, is even the town meeting members are not fully prepared. I mean, they don't know what every detail is in these articles. But they, uh, they but at least they show up, uh, and they have some people try to explain it to them. But uh, a lot of people are interested in numbers, especially budget numbers. Well, the booklet that they sent out, that I received. Oh yeah, last they get a package. Week, it explains every article, and I think for the most part the language is pretty straightforward. The only thing is sometimes you have to read the article and just understand what a yes vote means versus a no vote because sometimes they have the wording that is not very clear and you have to read it to it twice, maybe three times to understand what a yes represents and what a no represents. But other than that, I think that the booklet is very nicely put together from what I have seen so far. Well, I guess the town manager is responsible for getting part of that organized. I think the, was it the, uh, I don't know, town speaker? The town moderator. Town moderator, he gets involved in that too. Right. Yeah. Uh, but they use the staff that the town meeting manager has. He doesn't have a separate staff mm -hmm. just for him. Uh, so they, they put it together and they, of course the uh, moderator has to rehearse speaking the, the words and, uh, and uh, anyway. Now, where does where, where does this uh, electronic voting issue stand right now? Is it definitely going to be in place at some time in the future? Or are they still looking at a study? They're studying it. They're, going to, they're only going to uh, vote to study it. Uh, they're going to have to pick a committee, mm -hmm. uh, and then then the committee decides how they're going to study it. And mm -hmm. how how long of a period do they study it for? Do you know? Oh, that'll that'll come up, I guess, at the, in the article that they'll they'll want it by the next town meeting okay. or All right. the next annual town meeting. Give them some block of time there to come up with something. Um, they'll have to go to experts about the electronics and the right. and the other towns that have used. I it. was going to ask you: Are there other towns that use it and? How have they made out with that? Do they like it? Is it been something that's been productive for them, or has it been something that has contradicted some other ways in which they're running their meeting? So far, I haven't heard anybody using one at the town levels. Uh, they're lucky they got it at the state level. Mm -hmm. So you have other articles yeah, to th talk there's about. Another, uh, uh, another issue uh, that I'd like to discuss is an article that came, uh, was printed in the latest uh, issue of the Shoesby School Journal. And it's an article entitled uh, Crisis Avoidance. And it was written by uh, B. Dale McGee, who was at that time the school committee chairman. Yeah. I, I don't believe he is now because they've reorganized. And he is proposing that from what I read it, just saying that we're eventually going to need another override to, uh, to, uh, to run the schools properly. And there are some questions I have about that. He claims that the school system needs 3 to 4 percent more money per year to maintain services and the town revenues are not rising that fast. Any less over a period of time will lead to, a, uh, lead to cuts in services even though uh, schools cost much less than the average that does not exempt us from inflationary pressures. And 
a couple of things that I would just like to say about that. I have come to understand that the computation of the per pupil expenditure in Holliston, the method of, uh, I'm sorry, in, in Shrewsbury, the method of uh, uh, calculation is different than the method of calculation on other towns. Other towns include certain costs of running the school that are not included in the costs here in Shrewsbury. I believe some of them uh, revolve upon the cost of electricity, the cost of heat, the cost of school maintenance, the building maintenance. Those factors, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, belong to the general overall town budget, whereas in other and towns- other departments that right. provide those services. Right. Whereas in other towns, th those costs are figured into the school budget, and they're used to co compute the average cost of, uh, per, st per student. So therefore, there's one reason why the Shrewsbury cost per student would be less than what it is for other towns. Well, the, the biggest factor is the fact that we, the town owns the electric department, Yeah, everything in it. Right. Uh, the, the heat situation, varies a little bit, but, but there's always like electricity involved to control it. Mm -hmm. uh, the, <clears throat> the bottom line, I guess, is that each thing is negotiated separately. Like you have a school building and they'll say, you have phones, you have computers in there. Uh, a, a lot of the computers are provided uh, for maintenance by the cell code. So, I mean, there's a lot of government-owned things going on in other departments, and then they figure out what the charge is going to be to show up to do work. Uh, and they don't figure out the exact number, but they get a rate anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, I always felt it <clears throat> very comfortable that the town owns a lot of stuff that's provided to the schools. But when you do some kind of apples and apples comparison with other towns, you can't do it. No, you can't do it. Right. Uh, most towns don't own all those services no. to provide. So they're getting it from a private outside source. Yeah, well, or electricity is provided by several other companies. Uh, uh, gas is provided by a private company. Because uh, we have a lot of gas heat schools. Anyway, we uh, know that we can't make comparisons, but we can say, can you pay the bills that you do have? Right. Yeah. According to McGee, uh, every year there's going to be increasing costs. Now, the increasing costs are, that I have experienced in the last 20 years has been the school committee will give raises to administration and and uh, and student and uh, teachers uh, at a higher rate than they'll possibly ever get back in the next budget cycle. In other words, with the increase in taxes, which is an increase every year, which is at a lower rate than what they usually ask for. Uh, rate I'm saying is if the <clears throat> increase in property taxes is three percent a year, they ask for four percent. To cover their costs, but they already proved it. See, it's already in a contract before they make out the budget, which which bothers me. They haven't got the money yet, but yet they're promising to give away the storage. Right. And so uh, they're not wise in doing that. They only had one override so far, I think ever, uh, to make an adjustments from what the state provided for his income by fixing the tax rates in the town. It, it was set up uh, originally, and then after that, uh, you, you can figure out exactly what you're going to get, mm -hmm. but you can't figure out exactly your no. expenses. No. Now, the, the worst years is when the state comes up with some mandatory requirement. I mean, I can remember uh, them, them uh, needing more paperwork filled out on teacher res uh, forms for evaluations. They want to do it every year. They wind up hiring another principal at the high school to be able to f 
fill out more paperwork because we didn't have a, a principal for every grade. And so we, we try to spread that out. Uh, other things come up that's required by the state. Now, I know you say, what are they going to do with it? But actually, nothing ever leaves the, the city. They have a team of inspectors out of Worcester that comes to Shrewsbury every year to see if you've done any of this new stuff. As when well, you, when stuff. you say out of Worcester, out of the Worcester public school system? No, or? no, the state has educational offices I, okay, in Worcester. Okay, all right. They service all of Worcester County all right. uh, in some fashion. I don't know how many teams they got, but I have seen in discussion on TV once of one of the inspectors, and I know years ago it was always problems at the high school. Was, the class sizes were too big, uh, and so they they were always seeing if they were made any improvements. And so eventually when we got a new school, then they weren't looking at that anymore, even though we're, there is a problem there. But it's not as severe as it used to be. Now we need a, another vocational school is what we need. Yeah. But uh, in any case, they don't have a way of saying, well, here's a million dollar extra cost this year. They should have an override for every additional cost. Does the town want to pay it or not? Right. I mean, that should be a town vote. I should think so. It's the town's money. It's the town's money. Town money. It's the town's additional taxes in order to get it paid. Right. I mean, when you have a town budget and you get it approved, by the town meeting, you've approved everything that's in the budget. Now, if you're not paying some bill, then there needs to be additional taxes. And the only way to get that is an override to get additional tax money, which is where McGee's gone. Yeah. There's going to be additional costs. He needs more taxes so that he could pay the new bills. Uh, they're not happy at all with where they're going. Usually, they just take an argument that they don't want to go lower in their educational level. And, and then he came up with some really good, interesting arguments. Yeah. But we never go lower. Right. Somehow or another, so we we're steady. Yeah. Don't ask us to go up. <laughs> you, you talked about state mandates and federal mandates. And he mentions that here, too. Oh, and, yeah. And, he, and, he, and rightfully claims that many of these mandates are unfunded. And this is something that I had mentioned on a previous program. We've had this discussion. I do not see any type of uh, communication from the local school districts to the state, I would say, Department of Education or the federal Department of Education, who hands out these unfunded mandates to say, look, we cannot do this because we cannot afford it. It's distracting. It's taking away from the purpose of educating the children in the classroom. And what the state and the federal government has done, and you just mentioned it by having these, we have to have more evaluations. It's a small pace, paperwork. It's all more, let's say, more need for administration. In that case, it is, yeah. And nobody ever looks at the relationship between the quantity of administrative people that we have and the quality of, of instruction in the classroom and then relate that to the, rela to, to the learning of the students. Do the students really benefit from this? Do they really learn more because of all these things? In previous years, again, this is something I've talked about in previous programs, and if somebody's heard it before, please forgive me for being repetitive, but I must say this. I have done several statistical studies where I have compared the cost per pupil expenditure to achievement on the SAT scores, on the three arms of SAT, and also compared them to MCAS results. And no matter what sample of towns I choose, containing whether the sample contains Shrewsbury or does not contain Shrewsbury, we have absolutely no significant correlation between money spent and achievement on these exams. That means to say that there is not a cause and effect relationship between 
how much money we spend, and the students' learning. And unfortunately, in our society today, and I'm just going to have to go outside of education, the philosophy is if you have a problem, just spend money on it. And sometimes you have to spend money. And I'm not saying that we don't have to spend more money on education as we go along. But the question is, how much more? And we have to evaluate every dollar we spend in terms of its impact on learning in, in, in the classroom. The other factor that comes up that nobody ever talks about is the student's responsibility in learning and the parent's responsibility in the learning process, which really amounts to zero dollars extra in, in taxes. It's a cultural kind of problem, John, that we believe that more money is going to give us high, high, high result, better results when that's not the case at all. What's going to make the student learn better is what he does. And we can appoint, and we've talked about the several different characteristics of what a good student is. And this, when I, I saw the school committee meeting last night where they essentially honored the top, uh, top graduates of this year's uh, senior class. And every single one of those people, you could see they were dedicated students. That's why they are where they are. So to get more dedicated students, you have to have more parents that are encouraging them, that are supporting them to be dedicated. And we have to realize that not all students are going to be top scholars because not everybody has that ability to learn mathematics up to a very, very high level or to learn history to a high level or whatever subject you take. Some people just don't have the ability to do it. You've got to find other avenues for them. And I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see that happening. One other thing that uh, we should mention about cost, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe here in Shrewsbury we have uh, uh, classes that are all heterogeneously grouped. There's more heterogeneous grouping than homogeneous grouping in terms of in one class you'll see students of all different uh, ability levels versus having classes of just one ability level. I believe that is the case here in Shrewsbury. Yeah, I, I remember when I ran for school committee, I dropped by a middle, was a middle, no, grade school. And the principal there was brand new to Shrewsbury. Mm -hmm. He had all his time in Wooster before he got this job as principal. And, uh, but his assistant had the experience. And so, they had a late arrival to school. And so they had to get the assistant to sit down and figure out what class they're going to be in because they were going to take his school record and say, okay, maybe he looks like he's top third of the class right. and see if there's room for another top third. Because they were spreading them out because they have multiple classes in grade school. And so, uh, trying to get it so that not on more of the same as far as abilities. That's exactly what they were doing. And they could have taken all the smart kids and put them in one class at the beginning of the year and the ones that are not so smart yeah. in another class and everybody in between. And so they could have, but they don't do that. Uh, I, I think it deteriorates from the smarter students having the attention they need as well as the, 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 slow, the slow, if I may call them the slower students, and I don't say they in a derogatory way at all, but people of less ability, they don't get the attention that they uh, uh, need either. And there's cost to that because when you have all of these students of different abilities in the classroom, you need more aids. If you have one group of homogeneously grouped top students, you don't need any aid with those people. One teacher should be able to handle them, and even a, a, a larger group of those students can be handled without any problem at all. There is a, from a teaching point of view, it makes it very difficult for a teacher to teach one lesson to, in let's say three or four different uh, levels in one class to one, uh, in one class period to all of these students. I believe the former superintendent here referred to it as differentiated learning. That was a jargon that they had come up with. And for a teacher to do that is uh, very, very difficult. I, and I believe that when they do that, nobody benefits. 
nobody benefits. N all levels of students in that classroom do not get the full benefit of if you had one lesson that's intense just on them, just on their ability and on their interest. So having homo heterogeneous grouping, I think, is an expensive way to educate people. And as a teacher, to be able to have this differentiated learning is, uh, is let's say, time consuming without any type of reward, without any type of benefit at the end of the, of the class. I would say that much. So there is basically what I would have to uh, react to this, uh, to, to this article. And I understand his concern because you, you cannot keep on going down this road. Now, if we have an override next year, or whenever, if we have another one, how long is that going to last? It's going to last for two years. Yeah. And uh, I think that you know some other shows that we're familiar with have explained that when it happened. Right. Even before it happened, they said, you know, sure, you're going to get this money, you're going to put it in the school department and other departments, uh, and you're going to solve the problem for this current year and next year. But your growth rate and your expenditures are eventually going to outrun your income mm -hmm. yeah. again, and it did. And so they decided to cut services rather than ask for another override, right. uh, which goes to show you what kind of depth we have here, mm -hmm. because otherwise I would have thought we'd have had more failures of something so that somebody would be complaining about not performing either the teachers or the students, if we're both. But um, uh, we've, we've kept away from that. Of course, the only reason we got the override one year, and uh, I remember the middle school, they said if this person stays in an override, overcrowded classroom, we have studies that show within two years he will never go back to a normal student. He will be behind mm -hmm. forever right. from the you know, sixth grade, whatever, on, and into high school. And so uh, that scared people, and I think that's why they got to vote. But it looked like they were going to hit the, the wall. Yeah. We never hit the wall. Yeah. Uh, it was good we didn't, but uh, they had a study all ready for it. And now I have to get ready to leave. Our, our time is up, you say. Well, in a minute. So soon. <clears throat> but you, you, you did a good, good job tonight, uh, Charlie. I appreciate it, and I... I appreciate your concern about education all the years with me. Uh, you're obviously more detailed than I am when it comes to studies. And I'm still learning, John. I'm st always be a learner, wherever it happens to be. Uh, always have to learn. Well, I'm, I'm learning that we can't keep up with the money trail. Yeah. It's just not going to. It's not going to happen. You have to have a realization. You, you as an example. We've asked for four more classrooms in this new elementary school we're building for growth. I want to see if that happens because we've never done that before. And the state will have to prove mm -hmm. right. because they'll, they'll be paying for most of the cost of the classrooms because of the way they do the percentages. And so I, I just feel that it, it's coming to light again that unless they give us some wriggle room, we won't be able to do anything in the future without having trouble, especially in classrooms. Classrooms are precious. Good night, folks.